Welcome to the HIV podcast. Each week we focus on a person, historical event or pop culture moment linked to HIV and explore the story of what actually happened. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jess. And between us, we've been working in the field of HIV for 40 years. Our aim is to get as many people as possible HIV educated. Welcome to the HIV podcast. This week's special guest is a prominent figure in our sector. He's an activist, never afraid to speak his mind, open about his HIV status, and is just starting out in a completely new direction after a career in the armed forces. Welcome, Ollie Brown. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, it's just me clapping. I was, was going to say, um, and Jess is there clapping in spirit. And yes, I'll... I might get Zoe to add sound, sound effects. Lots yeah, of applause. Just get Wembley Stadium. Uh... Yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> So, first of all, how are you? Um, yeah, good. Um, just sort of getting used to life, um, you know, without a uniform. So it's, well, I'd say it's almost like a grieving process because it's a vocation more than a job and it's all consuming. So it's it's a shock to the system, um, like just taking time and taking it in my step. So, but yeah, as ever, just looking forward um, and looking for the next person I get to um annoy um, Ah. the problem that I found so (laughs) oh fantastic so I mean it's this is a big change for you and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on but I also wanted to talk about how you were diagnosed because I've done my research Ollie this will surprise you because you do listen regularly to the podcast so you know how haphazard it is normally and you I know you were diagnosed in A&E weren't you yeah okay so what happened um, I, was, I simply sum it up as a biker bottle and a brick wall um, because I was in working in London and I was cycling through London. Um, a, I was on a bi- my bike, plastic bottle got caught in the tyre, um, ended up losing control, sliding along a brick wall and then sliding along the floor. Um, got up, sort of looked, looked myself over and thought, oh, <laughs> finger needs a bit of help um, yeah. and had no idea where to go, phoned a friend who I knew was London based. And it worked out that Chelsea and Westminster was the only place closest to go to. So got in a taxi, turned up, went into A&E. But one thing led to another from going, oh, I've got a sliced up finger. Can you have a look at it? They found my blood oxygen was low. So they had concerns that I had internal bleeding. So they did a full chest X-ray, um, found um, blurring around my nymph- lymph nodes. So they then did a full full body CT um, and blood tests. At that point, they were looking for early indications of um, cancer. Hmm. That was their their line of thinking. But unbeknown to me at the time, Chelsea and Westminster was still conducting an opt-out HIV test trial. And as a result of my bloods being taken in that A&E setting, I was tested for HIV as part of that. So I was then contacted and had the news broken that I've been, they worked out, found the answer. Hmm. Um, and they said that told me that I had been diagnosed um, with HIV. My immediate response, as odd as it sounds, was, "Well, at least it's not cancer." Yeah, yeah. The odd, even odder part of that is, I didn't really know about HIV, but I still gave it that pecking order. Mm. My reference point was Rent the Musical. Oh. They to be back then and cancer. It was yeah, like, oh. yeah. <laughs> um, actually, not too dissimilar in a way. Whereas now, HIV, it's lower than di- diabetes in its um effect on life mm. so i didn't even know but that was my reaction um so it was quite a I'd say out of the blue diagnosis i'd only had um one hiv test prior to then because mm. whenever i went for a sexual health screening i was considered not a risk um i i present in a heteronormative manner so mm-hmm. i wasn't seen as a at risk person um, and for me, sexuality is, well, I told 5 million people I had HIV before I'd even had a conversation with my family about my sexuality. So <laughs> um, I, I very much just don't see it as a, a thing. Um, and basically came out to my family by saying, hi, meet Rob. Um, so, oh. <laughs> so in the family WhatsApp group, it was quite a, <laughs> just, wow. a just a, a lasso for, here you go. <laughs> Nothing to it. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Well, it should be. <laughs> so that's that's always been my attitude. So because I just I'm Ollie, I'm not 
straight, gay, bi, what or whatever label people feel there is, the system missed me. So I was never targeted, never seen as at risk. Um, and as as there's been the studies, um, people in sexual health services are fearful to offer a test to someone they feel isn't of the um, stigmatised communities. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's a lesson to be learned there, isn't there? About yeah. I do think we're quite rigid, aren't we? And it's, it's these groups that are at high risk and those are the people that we should be targeting. We we generally don't think outside of those parameters. Yeah, we, we talk about hard to reach communities mm. of um, black African males, etc. cetera. Um, no, no, my view is your hard to reach community is your white heterosexual male. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not ones that it's hard to communicate with or hard to get into into the community mm. with. Mm. It's those that don't test. Yeah. So <laughs> your hard to reach is the hardest to achieve. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So already, I mean, I can tell you're very practical. Is this like a military thing or is this you? Um, I've always said that, yes, I joined the military when I was um, 18, 19. Mm. But there's always something that drew me to the military um, because I'm the youngest of four. So to have four kids, you have to run a household like the military. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's sort of just in the mindset. Um, and my dad is very practical. He's an engineer. So I think it's very much nurture yeah. um, and nature together, um, compounded by the military on top of that. Yeah. And you told your employers quite early on, didn't you? Yes. Um, so within 24 hours, I'd told over 20 people. I've always been a, well, take me as I am or don't, because I don't have the time if you, if you don't like it. So when I was diagnosed, um, I walked out Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, then into the Kobler Clinic, and everything was stacked up one from another, all of the mm. support there. Then I walked out the door. I'm working and living in London. I don't live there full, full time. So I just scrolled through my phone thinking, right, <laughs> who is there? Ended up speaking with someone I went through training with and had worked with relatively recently called Debbie. Um, went over to Whitehall, um, to where the Ministry of Defence met her on the steps of the entrance. Um, she could see there was a something sort of I wasn't okay, so we went to a quieter location, um, which happened to be the Montgomery Memorial, directly opposite Ten Downing Street, just around lunchtime during the week. So <laughs> when you say quiet, um, yeah, not that you quiet. Notice you because everyone's just going yeah. apart. Um, and literally just holds her there and then diagnosed. I've been diagnosed with HIV. Um, best response ever. I think we need a drink. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we literally we went up to Trafalgar Square. Um, and and Debbie ordered a bottle of Prosecco and then we just sat there and talked. Then I phoned, phoned my parents, phoned home to find that my dad was out. <laughs> so then set up a conference call with my mum and dad, <laughs> um, told them, um, told my sister and sort of my immediate family, um, told my line manager at work because that's ultimately my support network mm. at, this, at this time told the whole office so i was working for the head of the navy the first sea lord um it's a fast-paced job it's long hours it's non-stop so actually how are you going to cope if people can't look out for you mm. so that was then five people in the office so within 24 hours my whole family my immediate office and a few close friends um i'd already told that i was diagnosed with HIV. so an enigma in that sense, um, not that it's a competition. And again, if that's your personality, right? This is just yeah. what you see is what you get. I've had this news. I'm going to need your help to deal with it. By the way, Debbie sounds awesome. I think we all need a Debbie in our lives. Yes. Well, I've got two Debbies because effectively <laughs> got Debbie in the Navy and then Debbie from the Terence Higgins Trust. <sighs> Oddly, two Debbies throughout that have been a great support. So, I mean, it's a different way of dealing with a diagnosis. I mean, I'd say you you are quite rare. I think most people, it takes a long time for it to sink in. Um, and it's fascinating to hear kind of the flip side of that, to meet somebody that's like, no, no, this is, this is what's happening and this is how I'm going to control it and deal with it. But at the same time, it did take a long time to sink in in an odd way. Did it? Okay. Yeah. Um, because I carried on like that for a year, but because I've told everyone, I've dealt with it. 
But also, now I look back and I told people I had HIV. I then bombarded them with statistics, information, mm. facts. And people generally don't go, oh, how are you? And even if we say, oh, are you okay? We don't want the answer, no. Yeah. So, <laughs> so actually, I just avoided the emotional engagement around HIV. It stayed factual. I'd flipped into the military mentality of, okay, what do I need to do? Tick the boxes, go through the process. I completed the process, park it, mm. park mentalize it, move it over there. A year later, when I changed jobs, um, I went on a short course. And when I first met my instructor, told them everything, etc. And then they said, they asked me, um, oh, so how are you dealing with it? And I did my usual and they went, no, no, how are you actually dealing with it? And that was the start uh, that that tugged on the threads that then led to me realizing no i'm not actually dealing with it it was a i just i've described it as a tangled ball of red string but mm. so tangled i couldn't find the ends so it's just this dense ball and i'm just looking at it almost just jabbing and trying to grab at it but there's never an end of the string to start trying to unravel it yeah okay and so what happened then does everything come crashing down or yes and it, and it was at one specific point when I had moved to join a ship um, and it was a couple of days before it sailed. And it was that idea of, OK, I'm going to be out at sea with around 200 other people. No one knows. If someone finds out in everyday life, you can go home to your safe place. You can remove yourself from the situation. If someone finds out in that 200 community, everyone's going to find out. And where can you go? Because you can't just step off the ship. Yes. That mental, almost that, that fear of, I don't know how to control this situation. Mm. Um, that I basically just realised, no, I'm not okay. Um, I'm, I'll say, a professional masker. I've always throughout my career been and life been able to put on the face, walk out as if nothing's nothing's wrong. And this was so extreme that I was walking back into my cabin on the ship sitting down, staring at the wall, bursting into complete hysterics, but then going, right, I need to go do that, standing up and walking out without, without even a heartbeat, and then walking out, going to do what I did, then walked back in, sat down, carried on like that. The distance between the mask and reality was just so tall. It was a break. Yeah. And that's where I went, no, I'm not okay. And we've got this wonderful system in the military of the chaplaincy. Yes. doesn't matter if you're religious or not. Um, they may be. Um, and I, I exemplify the the level of non-religiousness of their support of um, one of the first people I told that I was gay was a Catholic priest. Really? <laughs> so, so that just gives you an idea of the level of non-religiousness of the, the interactions um, with no judgment, no, no, it was just a supportive conversation. So I reached out to the chaplaincy, phoned them and just went, I'm not okay. Um, and that's where everything kicks in. I um, left the ship, um, was medically downgraded, but then came home, was living by myself and realised that support was going to be about eight, nine months before it could kick in. So I was thinking, I'm not going to sit here staring at the wall for eight, nine months. Um, and that's where I then worked with the Navy to get support from the Terence Higgins Trust um, through their counselling service, because I was like, as you said practical attitude to things as like right there must be a way to get on with this mm. um, and that that was ultimately the route that started um, everything off oh so that's kind of setting you back on the right path because yes. I was beginning to think that you were a bit mechanical <laughs> like they really do train the, the armed forces <laughs> don't they to just not deal with emotion it's a useful skill yeah used it in the right way in the right um, quantity it's when I used it sustained mm. and kept going is unhealthy yeah yeah and you've got that kind of self-awareness and that strength to identify that yeah. and then do something about it honestly ollie if i was in some sort of emergency situation i am straight on the phone to you you'll find that i literally nothing will phase me you could literally be there just going oh yeah i'm missing a leg i've got <laughs> i'm not sure where my, my, my arm is and i just feel like right it's no worries um just sit down so, <laughs> so you can be screaming and i'll be like that's fine don't worry <laughs> yeah, it's all good we'll find your arm <laughs> it'll be here somewhere <laughs> yes oh so you you just mentioned that you kind of worked with uh terence higgins trust to what educate the um, navy well well eventually in a way 
Um, so individuals in the Navy, like my line manager at the time, um, absolutely amazing, had a really good understanding. And that makes sense when you realise that she was the vice president of the Royal Navy Rugby Union. So was aware of Gareth Thomas. Right. So that that meant that she had more knowledge than me when I was diagnosed. So really lucked out that she was my immediate line manager at the time. But the Terence Higgins Trust first helped me understand it with the right. council service. I think it was the biggest part. And during that time, I carried on as usual. Um, and I knew that I would face challenges in the Navy because ultimately I was medically limited deployable due to my HIV status. But at the same time, I had the privilege of having access to the head of the Navy. I traveled with him, worked with him, basically was that came part of his family as such for, for that period. So I had the conversation with him walking along South Kensington High Street at the traffic lights when a cyclist went past. <laughs> he said, oh, did you ever get the results from that test? And I just went, yeah, I was diagnosed with HIV. And so he just was strolling across the street. <laughs> so, and so I knew that I had, I had the ultimate support, as it were, um, because his reaction was, well, well that shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. It, he, he was aware of what it meant today and, uh, and went, no, it shouldn't affect you, you in service. Um, so I had his support. It wasn't until I had done the counselling, I was in the Stigma and Resilience workshops with the Terence Higgins Trust, that I realised that my mentality and attitude was um, resounding with a lot of people in the group. Just my, well, yeah, so what attitude mm. and all these different pieces. Um, and also just going, well, do you actually understand? Why Why do you disclose when you're having sex? And just, going, well, would you tell them that you've got diabetes? Would you tell them you've got gallstones? Would you, would you tell them any of these conditions that you can't give them? No. Well, you've got a condition that you can't give them. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> put, putting that logic out there. Um, so that just sort of took the whole process forward um, and sort of put my mind back into the day I was diagnosed, into what I say was the, the broom cupboard um, in the clinic, because they're never large, these consoles. <laughs> no, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> Both you shuffle in past the desk. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, the, the three things I didn't know is, um, do I still have a life? Um, when will I die? Um, what's my life going to be like? And do I still have a job? And those three questions I presented to um, the doctor. Um, her name was Jo. And when I said, do I still have a job? She hit the roof. Oh, really? Absolutely went ballistic. Um, and I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was, I was sort of like, well, I'm in the military. But then going through the journey, I then went, well, actually, hang on a minute. If that's the reaction, why? Hmm. So that, that then started me digging into things um and then me being me i was sat in a a, a session for with the chronic conditions and disabilities um network in defense there's about 40 people on the call and they're discussing why people don't know about the network and i just said well it's because of the way that you approach promoting the network and they're like what do you mean and it's like well you put the condition before the network and you re re rarely reference the network they didn't under couldn't understand what i was saying i was like okay so if i introduce myself and i go oh um i have hiv and I'm supported by the Candid Network. And then it was silent and they went, sorry, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, so you just explain it, that you have to state what you have and supported by the Candid Network. Everyone else, everyone here goes, I have HIV or I have Crohn's or I have cancer. Mm. And they went, no, 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 sorry, you've got HIV. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was just sort of dropped out there. Um, and then they asked me, oh, um, would you do a talk for us? I went, okay, and then picked a date in about two, three weeks' time. And then went to the Terence Higgins Trust. Um, been asked to do a talk in defence. When? Just in a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then did a talk to just over 100 people across defence from all ranks, civilians, military. And did actually end the conversation with, I have HIV, so what? And that's where the ball was firmly shoved um, down the hill. Um, mm. And everything with momentum built up because no one could answer it. No one could answer why. Because I just told them all the information. I told them all the the, 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 the real facts. I pulled out all the policies and they're gone, yeah, but I've got HIV. So what? Why does it matter? Yeah. But you're saying it does matter and there's no reason for it. Whoa. This is good stuff, yeah. isn't it? Did they just accept it? Was it like a light bulb moment for them? Or is this just the start of many conversations to get them into that mindset? 
So it was the start of many conversations, mm. but they were in that mindset. Um, okay. It's one thing I still tussle with today. Organisations. Okay. Individuals make an organisation, but how many individuals' minds do you need to change to get the organisation to change? And that's what we're uh, sort of facing. How do you get everyone's interest and momentum? Mm. And it was having senior support that then ended up with conversations in corridors that basically amplified the conversation within the service and the other t other services, doing things like just phoning up the head of diversity and inclusion in the army and going, oh, well, I'm sorry, but um, your policy um, is quite offensive and borderline illegal. <laughs> and just, just literally going, not disrespectfully, but just going around the system. We have ranks. Yeah, but it doesn't mean I can't talk to you. It's People seem to think that it means that you have to follow the chain. No, you go by the most expeditious route and just go, yeah, this is the situation. You're the person to deal with it. Mm. So deal with it. And they sent an email out that afternoon saying, this policy has been highlighted to me. These are the concerns. If question, I'm deleting it. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's that sufficient. Oh. Because so, they said if no one's raised it as a problem, until now, and it's not been updated for years, is clearly not needed. And they're right. Yeah. And I thought, oh, actually, I'd prefer to have no reference to HIV mm. in a way, because if there's no rule, you're not restricted. That's very true, actually. And if, if we're trying to normalise this, which I think we all yeah. are, that's it, the right approach. You don't need something written. It just needs to be. Um, so that was everything inside. And it was the sort of me being the, the, the inside person whilst THT were able to leverage the outside and give that agitation of we know what's going on mm. the pub from the public side but also then being able to leverage their network across other government departments to get government equalities office on board and even to the point that um uh, number 10 were um, on board so you've got the whole of government moving in the same direction mm. um but also as odd as it sounds, being able to know what each other is thinking without talking, because we were doing the talking for them. Yeah. We yeah. were making sure everyone was on the same page. So when it came to the big meeting, they all went in apprehensive to then sit down and go, oh, we all agree from the beginning. <laughs> oh, okay. We had shaped it so that once it got to the crunch point, it would go, everyone would go, oh, okay. And then the, the final stage is... We'd all, all the conversations behind it had happened before. Um, so it just meant that, that it, it went smooth, smoothly. Then the final hurdle is, okay, we've agreed this. Let's make it happen. That's generally the hardest part. We said yes. When are we going to do it? Um, uh, well, government, particularly at the time, loves nothing better than having a story. Saying we've changed a policy doesn't make a story. Having a face does. And that's where I effectively um, sold my soul to the devil and went, okay, you can have my story. I will go into the media alongside that that policy announcement. Oh, my god! Why did you do it by World AIDS Day? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went, you can have it, but I, I want to do it then. Yeah. Just so that then there was that incentive for them. And if they didn't do it then, you don't have me. Hmm. Um, so it just wrapped it up with an incentive um, because the only other incentive that I did use when I was asked, well, why should we do this was because it's the right thing to do. I'm not going to stand here and shout at you about a load of benefits and cost bonuses. It's the right thing to do. Get on with it. Um, <laughs> so between those two just simple ways, they agreed. And um, everyone's favorite paper, the Daily Mail, um, it had a line in it, which sums up the whole situation, which was um, this announcement progressed so fast that even our even our sources didn't know it was happening really so, yeah. so we out maneuvered the, the daily mail's sources they they asked their sources and they went we didn't even know what's going on i would expect nothing less from the military yeah, so excellent yeah but that that's when i took the conscious decision to speak out knowing it would have an impact um and ultimately as you said formally of of, of the navy I knew that would be the ultimate outcome um, mm. for various reasons. And as I said, Debbie, Debbie Laycock from Terence Higgins Trust, it's probably one of the first conversations that we had, whereas I, I know what the ending will be. What I don't know is when. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, so you've gone like 
national, not even national, probably international now with your diagnosis. But the result is that you've changed policies that it's not just the Navy's working to, is it? It's the other armed forces as well, the, the Army, the Air Force. Yeah, so you can you can now join the the UK armed forces if you're living with HIV. Oh, Ollie, how does that feel? You've engineered that. Um, so it didn't it didn't feel real until I got a phone call from Richard Angel, the now chief executive. Mm. Um, I was shopping in Lidl, <laughs> just wandering down the middle aisle, um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and he phoned me because he'd been he was at a conference. Um, and the case study had been pre- presented of individual who was a um, child li- living with HIV. Um, they were lost to care, um, completely disengaged. Um, and it turned out that they saw my, they were um, living on the streets, but happened to hear or see about my story. And they went from there to re-engaging with care. Um, and looking to pursue a career in, in the Navy, just because they realised that gave them that hope. Um, yeah. And I've always said, I'm not, I've not, I've not done this to to change the military, to change policies. I've done it to make sure that just one other person doesn't have to feel how I did mm. or go through what I did. And it doesn't matter as long as there's just one other person that doesn't have to do it. That's all I did it for. Yeah, yeah, to make a difference to other people. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't, it, the vol- the amount of them, it doesn't matter, just one, mm. just so they didn't have to face it. Um, and coincidentally, um, there's like, there's now an informal guideline rule um, that Royal Navy Medical takes the approach of. Um, one of them sort of jokingly said, oh yeah, it's now, it's, it's almost like the Ollie rule. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because if, if an issue is raised to, raised to them, it's quite often they sort of like, oh no, no, we've got bigger things to deal with. They're now going, no, does it affect one person? Mm. And if it affects one person, they deal with it. Brilliant. And it's just that mentality of, yeah, if there's something wrong and it affects one person, it must affect another. It must affect more, but they're the unseen. Mm. They're, the, they're the people without a voice. So yeah. take what the, the one voice that you do have and do something about it. And you got an MBE for this, didn't you? Yes, yeah. Um, so it was... T- um, uh, King Charles's first honours list, and it's <laughs> there was there was an aspect of poetic justice um, to it um, because I did have a comment slung in my direction of oh you're only doing this to get three letters after your name, um, and I responded no I'm good thanks I've already got three letters this HIV. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, so it was, it's 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 a great sort of honour, but. It's like getting a degree or a GCSE without having sat an exam. Mm. Because to me, I just did it. Yeah. It's just something I did. And it sounds a bit almost ungrateful. Oh, no, no, I just did. Well, I did just do it. But it's great that I've had that recognition. Um, but still, I just sort of sit there and go, Mm-mm. yeah. But um, we jokingly call them in the military, um, MBEs, many buggers efforts. <laughs> <laughs> OBEs, other buggers. <laughs> so, but I do, I do feel that actually it's recognition of many people's efforts because it was sure. the face um, that went out there. Mm. There's people like Dr. Joe Heskin at Chelsea and Westminster who provided all of the medical sort of support information. Um, <laughs> sat, sat, sat alongside me in many presentations and meetings, all the way through to um, members of parliament on all sides of the house, members of the House of Lords, Terence Higgins Trust, National AIDS Trust, Bashba, um, friends, family, random connections um, and support the whole way. Um, a Twitter Twitter network. Um, oh. Uh, there's, uh, if, 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 you, if you find someone trolling me um, at any point, you'll generally find someone correcting the information or steering them in a, in the right direction. Nice. Um, so I've been never engaged, um, but people have on my behalf. On the That's grounds of good. Yeah, combat disinformation, don't mm. try to change their mind because yeah. some people's minds just won't be. So long as the right information is next to it. So. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, and you, you've left the Navy now. Yes. What's next for you? Um, A break. <laughs> so... um. I'm, I'm effectively because there's 
a lot lots of layers and parts to um, the journey um and it's just been one situation after another i've not taken pause um i'm gonna say it was a year coming to terms with hiv it was a year speaking out with it and then it was a year dealing with what is can only be sort of described as celebrity um and people knowing you without you knowing them um so that's quite a lot in that time frame to sort of have to deal with so i'm just going to take three months or so just to catch up on life um as in like do some stuff around the house um and bits and pieces but also then actually have those conversations to understand what could i do next yeah um i've always never seen hiv as my box um hiv just happened to be the subject what could i apply my skills to next um, well, okay. it would be easier to say what couldn't you apply them to? <laughs> You've got such a broad range of skills; it's amazing. It's like, effectively, just give me a problem. <laughs> oh, well, exactly. There yeah. are many <laughs> problems in the world, Ollie. Come on, we can Absolutely. get through this. Um, and that's that's what I'm trying to scope out, understand. Sure. Yeah, I've got, got ideas, but I very much don't restrict myself to my ideas because actually, it's everyone else's ideas that have has more interest and value quite often. Um, so see what see what 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 comes of it, but I'll be a nightmare if I sit around idle. So oh, I don't think there's any danger of that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'll see you at the World Health Organization or some NATO summit <laughs> leading the way. Come on, guys, this isn't this shouldn't be an issue. Well, if if you invite me to large events like that, often people are running away from me because I've given them a hard time somewhere else. Oh. So, when it came to opt-out testing, um, I, was, I was starting to I could be convinced that Amanda Pritchard, chief executive of the NHS, was avoiding me at events because every oh. time, <laughs> every time it's like, so <laughs> where are we? <laughs> well, I like it. I've got one more question for you. And that is, tell us about the tattoo, uh, tattoo on your toe. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, my brother, so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the youngest of four. Mm. Uh, the brother, one older than me, Andrew, um, he is a tattooist and has been since day dot. He was the one sibling out of all of us I least expected to sort of know about HIV, but oddly knew the most because he proactively took an interest because of his profession. Um, he tattooed me ooh, uh, probably, so it was post my diagnosis. Uh, I think it was about 2020. Um, for, that was the, my first and only tattoo at the time. And it's a script of Memento Mori on my foot. And literally, oddly enough, no conversation was, was needed, um, nor, nor should there really be as mm. such. Um, but then... He phoned me um, the day after World AIDS Day um, and said, right, you're coming over to my studio in East London um, and I'm tattooing a red ribbon on your big toe. That seems a bit random, but it all comes from the fact that we were both in London whilst I was doing the work on the lead up and we just we went for a night out and he asked me the question, so what is HIV to you? And I just went, oh, it's no more or less important than my big toe. Oh, it's just, right. It's part of me. Um, so, and both him and my other two brothers have the letter B for the surname Brown on their big mm. toes. And it's on the same big toe um, <laughs> as, as them. Um, so, yeah, so he tattooed a red ribbon on my big toe the day after, basically, I told everyone <laughs> um, no. I was living with HIV. But the bit I've subsequently reflected is... Your big toe is the smallest body part that you can lose and not be able to walk. Is it really? Yes. Yeah. So if you don't have your big toes, you're unable to balance. Right. So actually, I, it's almost more profound <laughs> that it's on my big toe. Yeah. And, and I just made the throwaway comment, it's, it's as important as my big toe because it is, but actually it's significant whilst being insignificant. Yeah. Um, and it is... It is part of me, and I'll, I've listened to various ways people refer to it. Of actually, I'm the I'm the host to it. Oh, it's just in me. To me, it, it's just part of me. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah I'm Ollie. <laughs> so there you go. Exactly. Yes, it shouldn't identify <laughs> like, you, should it? Yeah. 
So, but... brilliant. Do you know what? It's been so lovely talking to you. I know whatever you go on to do, you're going to smash it. I don't think it's in your nature not to be able to do that. No, but I... you are a huge inspiration to everyone here at TVPS. Oh, thank you. It's great to know that to know that you give people hope. Um, I think that's that's one of the most sort of uplifting parts. Yeah. Um, and sort of always remind myself that in the in the in the low times, which there have been many, um, you, to know that you've been that sub- something for someone that's given that hope. Because so long as you have something to hold on to, yeah. Oh, you most definitely do that without a shadow of a doubt. You are ticking that box every single day. So, Ollie, while I've got you here. I need to ask you a question that's nothing to do with HIV, but it's the perfect opportunity for me to solve this problem that I have. How do I stop being seasick every time I go near a boat? Okay. Um, There's various, various people swear by different things. Um, Yes. Scientifically, if you lay on the floor on your side with your head at the pointy end, the forecastle of the ship. Seriously? Yes, because it's the nodding motion. That makes you feel seasick. Really? Yeah. So if you're in that position and as central to the ship as possible, it isolates the nodding motion. See, I knew you'd be able to solve this. Can you help me yeah. with another issue that uh, well, I don't yeah, understand? They, well, the other one's ginger biscuits. Oh, well, I'm fully on board with that. I love ginger biscuit. Ginger biscuits settle your stomach without fail. How many packets? <laughs> as many as you can manage. <laughs> Before you're sick. <laughs> Yeah, just don't get to the point that you're sick because of too many biscuits and you're sorted. That will be the challenge for me. Okay, we can do this. The other thing I want to understand, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't understand how boats work. I mean, they float because they've, hold on, they float because they've got air in them, right? Is that right? No. Oh! (laughs) Because you open the door and it would sink then otherwise. Right, okay. Oh, how do boats work, Ollie? So displacement on the basis that they don't push hard enough down for the water to get inside. So if you put a if you put a bowl in the sink, yes, yeah, yes, and then you put, if you keep pushing it down, eventually the the pressure around the the bowl reaches the edge and fills it. So and that's why ships capsize because ultimately, as more more of the ship goes into the water, there's more water pushing it up because more. Yeah. Area goes in, but eventually it reaches a what they call the vanishing point, mm. which where the weight of the ship outdoes the amount of contact there is to the water pushing it back. Okay, well then, yeah. what submarines? Well, how do submarines float then? They've got tanks that they let water in and control the amount of water, which changes the amount how much is pushing them up. So they make themselves heavier and heavier and heavier that they then go under. And that's how they stay in the same position in the water. So they don't right. go under and then drop. Yes. A set amount of water and the water pressure around them is then steady. Um, but the, the scary part is um, the vanishing point of a ship. Um, ships are designed with fail safes, whereby if they reach the vanishing point, there's bolts and fixings that are designed to snap if they go too far. So... If you're in really rough seas and the ship's, ship's tipping really far, yeah, inside the main bit because the top bits could fall off. <laughs> well, this is reassuring. Oh. It's, it's better than it going upside down and everyone dying. <laughs> so, I mean, future journeys to France will be under the tunnel, I think. <laughs> yes, can't yeah. risk yeah. this. Is that what happened in Titanic then? Oh, no, that snapped in half. That just snapped. Yeah. Well, they thought that they were unsinkable because they had changed the way that they had done the compartments, um, but then they didn't realise that you need to seal the compartments. So they did them vertically and slightly. I see. So me fretting on a channel ferry that everyone's breathing in the air too much and we're going to sink is a bit unfounded, really, is it? It's unnecessary. Um, Well, in theory... Um, on that principle, so say you're on a submarine and you're all inside and everyone was breathing, eventually, if if you didn't run out of oxygen, just ignore that technicality, um, you would then turn into a, a Coke can, a very compacted Coke can. Oh, my God. <laughs> See, what happens when a submarine sinks. Um, yeah, I mean, for the record, yeah. I'm never going to go on a submarine. Nah, no, you, it's like you just get turned. It's like a can crusher. Coke no can. way. Have you been on a submarine? 
Um, no, I have stood inside the steel ring of a submarine being constructed and walked yeah. one not in the water. <laughs> it, but no, I'm the submarines are not for me. My brother-in-law does that. That's their problem. Um, but they refer to us as targets. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's amazing. So, if you're not everything other than a submarine is a target. So, oh my gosh. Oh, Ollie, we should do our own podcast all about engineering and way educate me on how things work because I don't understand how planes work either, but we can discuss that another oh. time. Oh, I was in the air cadets and I, was, and I was an air cadet instructor, so I can explain how they work. Seriously? Yeah. My sister's got an amazing analogy of men running over a hill and th- under a hill so, <laughs> for a plane wing as to how airflow works. But she did train to be a science teacher. So <laughs> You've just got like the cleverest family, haven't you? It's amazing. Oh, and we all do something totally different. Mm. Our parents always said, we don't care what you do so long as you're happy. Yeah. Oh, I so, bet Christmas is a fun when you all get together. Oh, it's no. like an episode of QI. No, it's 24 hours and we're killing each other. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, 24 hours 48 hours absolutely not 24 and a little bit more we might be able to manage <laughs> oh brilliant right that really is it now we're all done oh that end was abrupt sarah <laughs> cut, where, cut have you po- where have you popped up from i know where have i been all episode it's like i've been secretly mm. listening from behind the sofa quietly See, I knew. I knew I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you weren't. You were with Ollie, but I was also there. No, I wasn't. Right. Just to put Ollie's mind at rest, you (laughs) weren't there lurking in the background, were you? But you are here today recording this on a different day, a little ending to sum up the episode. Yes, yes, we are. And just to say that, obviously, I am back. But, um, you know, because obviously people might be like, well, she's gone again. Where's she gone now? What's happening? She's renounced. She's back. And then she's left again. Sarah pushing me out the podcast again. No, you're back like a bad smell. <laughs> yep, just hanging around, never leaving. <laughs> yeah, how I describe myself, you know. <laughs> Is that what you put in your bio? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We literally we've just been invited back to be um, filter judges for the British Podcast Awards, which we're both really, really, really proud that they've invited us to do that. But we had to put a bio, and that's why I put Sarah hangs around like a bad smell. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, no, so we are back, but obviously Sarah recorded with Ollie while I was still away. So just wanted to pop in and say, what an amazing episode. Well done, Sarah. Amazing work, Ollie. Well, wow, amazing work, Ollie. So articulate. We can only dream of being that articulate. I know. And it's been edited and it's still long. And he didn't was need articulate. Didn't need a lot of editing for him. Me, every few seconds. You always need a lot of editing. As do I, Sarah, as do I. Thanks for listening to the HIV podcast. If you enjoyed our podcast, please like, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can now also follow us on Instagram and TikTok at the HIV podcast for behind the scenes insights and video. The HIV podcast is produced by Thames Valley Positive Support.